So we're here talking about uh, the longevity dividend. Um, I'm going to start with, with David, because I'm going to begin macro, and then we're going to start to drill down more. Uh, David, you, you and I cut our teeth uh, in the early days of research looking at macroeconomics and demographic change, and it's about the ageing society, old age dependency ratios, and for a long while we've been expecting this sort of gloom, a silver tsunami, uh, rising old age dependency ratios, fewer workers, higher health care. How do you think that, that gloomy scenario has been playing out? I think, I think you're right that people get very gloomy about this. It amazes me that many economists, who, who by nature are gloomy perhaps, uh, still produce charts which show an old age dependency ratio, which is usually the ratio of two numbers. It's the proportion of the population aged between 16 and 64, and the proportion of the population that's over 64. And they show projections of that into the future. And they say, this is awful. This is going to be really difficult, because there, there aren't enough people of what they call working age relative to the number of people who have to be supported. And people have been producing these pictures for decades now and convinced themselves, and indeed many of the, the, the wider public, this is an awful problem. I think what's bizarre about this, there's lots of bizarre things about this. Firstly, it's very strange to keep this age, these age ranges constant. As we all know, life expectancy has gone up, and most of the increase in life expectancy are, are as far as I can see, sort of relatively good, healthy years. Another thing that's really bizarre about these charts, um, and you do see them an awful lot, is that the purport, in the UK, I think this is probably true in many countries, but the, the UK data I'm familiar with, the proportion of the population who are aged over 65 who are still working, who are in the labour market, um, so-called participation ratio, is double now what it was in 2004. So even in a relatively short period of time, one of the parts of this ratio that people focus on has, has, has doubled. So it's a bit bizarre. Um, and I think it does lead to all kinds of unfortunate views. Um, the view that there is a terrible problem, that there won't be enough workers, there's too many people to support who can't look after themselves, sometimes leads to the ludicrous proposition that the reduction in fertility, which is, of course, another part of <coughs> the phenomenon that drives this particular ratio up, the sort of lower number of uh, young people that are being born relative to 20, 30, 40 years ago, the perception that, certainly in Europe, this is a huge problem and we have a fertility crisis, and then we must encourage more uh, children to be born. We must, we must increase the population rate, both in Europe and perhaps even globally, to stop this ratio, these fixed numbers, 64 plus as a ratio of 16 to 64. We must have ever-rising populations and possibly even accelerating growth of populations to stop this ratio rising. This is stark raving bonkers. I mean, the world has got too many people probably now. I mean, the growth of the population, which is going to be enormous anyway, is one of the huge problems of the world. So I, I do think that economists are very guilty, actually, for encouraging a view that, that, that uh, ageing, which brings with it all kinds of opportunities we've heard about today, is a huge problem. I think it's the opposite of that. Yeah, I mean, Joe put the, you know, pointed the finger to economists, the dismal scientists, saying we turn this tremendous achievement of longer, healthier lives into a negative. And it is that use of the old age dependency ratio that's the heart of it. Yeah. I, I, we'll come back, but thank you for that, David. I want to turn to Yvonne now. I mean, David pointed out that uh, you know, the, the participation rate and indeed the employment rate of older workers is increasing dramatically. And in the US over the last 20 years, uh, the US has created 22 million extra jobs, employment. And if you were to look at where those jobs have come from, they haven't come from uh, you know, Brooklyn, they haven't come from Silicon Valley. 90% of those jobs have come from workers aged over 50. And similarly, you find the same sort of proportion in France, and Germany, Japan, a little bit less in the UK. But of course, this is then impacting what firms are doing. So Yvonne, can you talk us through a little bit about what you see happening at the corporate level? Because if people want to work for longer, can they, and mm. how are firms responding? Yeah, well, we, we see organisations doing four main things at the moment. They're actually using much uh, deeper look in, at analytics and business impact modelling to examine their own organisational data and to actually discover what drives business performance. Interestingly, and we've been looking for this evidence for years, it, it's really been the ROI that companies are, uh, really need. It's that, that kickstart to, to keeping older workers in the population. 
Interestingly, using that type of analytics, we find that age-diverse teams outperform. I'll say that again. <coughs> age-diverse teams outperform. There's a lot of reasons for that. Experienced workers actually lower costs in the business because they're less likely to leave. The cost of a lever is anywhere between 25 and 300% of an annual paycheck. So turnover is expensive. Interestingly, experienced and older workers also lower the turnover rate of the people they supervise. So their own teams turn over lower. They're like the glue that keep the teams together. A 5 percentage reduction in turnover saved one of our clients $66 million a year. Um, experienced workers also increase productivity. Now, we did one study which looked at dozens and dozens of bank branches across the US. So all of these branches were pretty homogenous. They all look the same. To, to really dive into what's driving performance in those bank branches, you can strip out all of the variables. The one strongest variable that drove performance across this bank was tenure, years of service. One extra year of service increased productivity in this bank by $40 million increased revenue. Yet 20% of job leavers in the UK in recent years, aged over 50, are being made redundant. It makes no sense. So we're encouraging more and more employers to examine their own organisational data to see what, uh, what, what drives performance and then how to optimise that structure. And that could well be achieved through age-diverse teams. The second thing companies are doing, I think this one's a really interesting one, particularly for me. I grew up in the retirement industry, so pension schemes, <laughs> sadly, have, have been my life for, for 30 years. Um, but just looking at retirement plan design and flexible working together. Now, it, it, typically companies don't do that. They're, they're very diverse teams. The retirement team and the... Um, the, the team that might look after organisational structure and design don't, don't speak the same language, so they, they often don't collaborate. But just looking at the impact of those two on how you can phase retirement. If we understand, and there'll be a lot of data from my talk, because I'm a consultant after all, across the world's top eight developed countries, there's already a $400 trillion savings gap. So that's the gap between what people have already saved and what they actually need to live out their lives. And that's manifesting in something like um, running out of money somewhere between 8 and 20 years before you die. So the prospect of living to 150, as you can imagine, fills me with horror because this is based on today's longevity and we're already 8 to 20 years short of that. Um, lots and lots of work around people wanting to work differently. In focus groups I did in the UK this summer, four out of, pe four out of five people want to work differently in future. Half of them want more flexibility, so winding down, and employers need to recognise that. That's multi-generational, it doesn't just affect older workers. Um, but also, the, the other half actually wanted a new challenge, and already a, a lot of them have started to embrace that new challenge. So the third thing we're seeing companies doing is addressing ageist practices head on. So things like pay, promotion, bonus awards, performance grade and hiring equity checks, not, bro not widely done at the moment, about three in ten companies do this, but of those that do, around two thirds of them say these are very effective in making me a much more age friendly employer. And interesting, even more shocking, is that only one in ten companies examine the age distribution of training <coughs> spend. Um, and if they do, they'll find it's heavily skewed towards younger workers. And then finally, the fourth thing companies are doing, which I think is really paramount, is adopting an attitude to lifelong learning. Um, one of the myths about older workers is they can't learn, they don't want to learn, they're slow at learning. And actually, that's a... That's a a conception some people hold of themselves that they can't learn. As many as 57% of workers in the US in some states already have skills anxiety. So they feel they need more training and education to stay relevant for jobs of the future. And in focus groups I've done this year, we found as many as 62% of the over 50s prioritise lifelong learning in their future development plans. And 55% of them had already started to undertake 
new learning programs. So that's a few of the things that companies are doing too. Fantastic. To I think both Dave and I as professors were surprised to hear you say that productivity increases with tenure, but I think you were probably using a different meaning of the word tenure there than the one that we were thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but, Long uh, term. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, uh, very good to hear. Um, uh, by the way, I, uh, um, we're using Slido. Uh, please put your questions through and I'll try and feed them through to our, our, our panellists. Um, uh, Joe, I'll turn to you next because uh, obviously if we're talking about the economic opportunities here, uh, if you think about thematic investing, there's lots of interest in AI and robotics. I see more and more interest in green funds. What's the interest in this particular space? We obviously live in a world with very low interest rates. <coughs> Investors should be searching for rates of return. Do you see much evidence of it yet? And if so, what form is it taking? Yes, just before answering that, I want to state I'm not an economist. So, um, you can be, optimi you can be optimistic bad, about but... everything then, that's fine. Uh, that's, uh... No, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting question because it's a topic that we don't get much question on. And when people think about longevity, they don't really think about longevity, they think about aging. So if you think about the big themes that you have uh, in the world, you know, it could be the next gen, so the younger generation, it could be sustainability, climate change. Um, but then when it comes to longevity and the fact that we live longer, it's not about the dividend. We heard about the, the, the dividend uh, that we could have. It's more about what are the issues. And then you kind of think, oh, I want to have like, some opportunities to invest in senior residents, or I want to invest in leisures that are targeted towards the older generation, <coughs> or maybe some solution to help them. And we heard from Joseph that typically they are not very successful because they come with um, some sort of stigma for the population. So it's actually an investment uh, thematic that doesn't work very well because it's, it's not very well identified. The one part where you get money and where you see some success is more on the, the way to get older, that is healthcare, biotech, medtech. I think there you see interest because everyone wants to live longer, even though not everyone knows how they will use those years, but I think that's, that's the key. And I think for the investor, that's what we get. But when you speak with, for example, engagement team at some of the very large companies in the UK, and I had the opportunity to do that last week, um, we spent 90% of our time talking about climate change, yeah. sustainability. And then after the meeting, I asked them, do you have any investor uh, asking you about, you know, uh, maybe the most, more obvious one, the pension issue, you know, the ticking bond and all that? Not really. And, and are you thinking about solution um, for your own organization? He says, no, it's not, it's not on our agenda. So I think some companies are clearly doing it, but I think it's rather an exception rather yes, than the norm. Yeah. I think there's a sort of will-o'-the-wisp, elusive nature about longevity as an investment class. For the health reasons, you, you know, the health of the market, I think it's well-defined. But as, as Joe was sort of saying, we, I thought the example of glasses was a great one. You know, it, it's, it, it's, just a, it's just people in life buying things. I think the other challenge with, uh, you know, aging, this theme of malleability that we're talking about, there's another part of that which is just diversity. And actually, this is increasing, I think, a hard market to characterize because people age in a very, very diverse ways. And we keep coming back to that when we talk about inequality, which, of course, is you know, part and parcel of that malleability. But I think it also makes it a little bit more elusive as an investor category, too. But, Cynthia, I want to turn to you because, of course, the ARP is this extraordinarily uh, prominent, successful, and large institution. It's been driving an agenda around this for a long while. So perhaps you can give us the US perspective on where you're going and what you've been doing to support this market. Certainly. Um, just a little bit of a little overview for those of you that aren't familiar with AARP, and thank you, Linda and others, for the positive press that we have received today. Um, we are a United States-based organization, nonprofit, nonpartisan. We have membership of nearly 38 million members, ages 50 and older. Our mission is to empower people to choose how they live as they age. And we do that by focusing on three areas that you've heard much about today, what we call health security, financial resilience, and personal fulfillment. It's health, wealth, and self is um, how we talk about it um, in the office. Uh, we have also become very involved. We recognize we can't do this alone, have become very involved on the global stage, participating in events like this, working with others, thought leaders, others on programs and policies that are also of interest to us, again, with with the aging population. But um, from an economic perspective, we've done what I believe to be some very interesting um, things at AARP. 
Joe mentioned this, the longevity economy. In the United States, we think about that, or we've quantified that as $7.6 trillion of economic activity that is generated by the 50 plus, direct and indirect activity. And when we stepped back and looked at this, we said, um, we've got this enormous opportunity from an economic perspective. We're looking at the needs of the 50 plus. What can we do? How can we uh, be a leader in this space? So we took an investment perspective and have made a couple of um, interesting bets in the venture capital space. We formed an innovation fund via ARP Innovation Fund, a $40 million private equity fund that focuses on an, providing capital to early stage companies in the consumer healthcare space. I'll speak a little bit more about that this afternoon. We, last year in commemoration of our 60th anniversary, formed the AARP Brain Health Fund, a $60 million venture capital fund that's focused strictly on finding a cure for dementia and Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. and